Dre here. Just keeping you in the loop. We're still having some growing pains with the podcast. Uh, You may notice about halfway through Skype crashed on us. A fun note, Skype has a setting where it resets your audio level. So I went super quiet and Brian basically stayed super loud. Uh, We did some post-process editing on that to try and make the sound level sound good. But there were still a few places where Brian and I are both talking and it's kind of hard to do it. So you may notice some choppiness and some volume differences. Apologies for that. We'll work on it for the future, but hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome back to another Boxcore Geeks show. We have a momentous occasion today. This is the 50th show we've done. You could do some clever counting, maybe make number 52, but we're calling it number 50, and that's great. On that note, you may recall at the end of last year, I started talking about myself moving as host back to Nerd Numbers. We had some discussions. Basically, as I had mentioned, I still wanted to work with the Boxcore Geeks. So... What we're going to be doing is next week, we're going to be moving to channel nerd numbers on YouTube. We're going to be running the box score geek show as a show on channel nerd numbers. So don't worry next week, we'll give you the uh, subscription details, all that for that YouTube channel. Uh, We do run the show live. I realize uh, Brian, we didn't tweet it out at all today. So this show is going live to none of you who are watching it now, but don't worry. We'll start making that a normal occurrence. The showtime we're looking at doing is going on Mondays at approximately 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, but we'll give you an advanced update each week. So that's the exciting news. In the upcoming year, we're going to have live shows weekly. It'll be myself or Patrick hosting it. Uh, Those will be hosted on channel Nerd Numbers, which we'll start asking you to subscribe to to help out with. And for those of you that just like the podcast, don't you worry. The RSS, the channel, everything for that is going to stay the same. Uh, Now, with that said, I'm Andres Alvarez, a.k.a. Nerd Numbers, and as always, this show is produced by the voice of God himself, Brian Foster, who you can find on Twitter as BoxScoreBrian. Give a quick shout-out, Brian. What's up, Dre? We've got a lot of variety on the show tonight, and we did some longer-form topics last month, so this will be fun, too, getting a taste of everything, I think. I I don't think we have too much of a... I think it's funny. We have, like, two different... We have two diametrically opposite things in that, you know, okay. between Patrick and myself. A funny story, so getting into the topics. The very start of this week, um, I started doing some research about Derrick Rose versus Jimmy Butler. That was the start of my week. And that got me down this really interesting vine where I was looking at former MVPs and their shooting efficiency. And I made an article that I titled uh, The Inefficient MVP of Derrick Rose, I think, or something like that. And I was going to title that the BS MVP of Derrick Rose. And I emailed Patrick and said, I'm, I'm actually a little nervous about this uh, title. I think I'm not going to do it. And I ended up pulling that title. So for those of you listening, the original title was BS MVP. I changed it to inefficient MVP. And then right after I wrote that post and was all nervous about the title, Patrick came out and made the article that had in it, we're all racists. So yeah, I think Patrick, I, I was chuckling to myself. I was like, I think I was worried about offending people with my title to start. But yeah, so those are our two topics, uh, Derek Rose and racism. And in the meantime, since that happened, there was a, I don't know what you'd call it. A tr- I don't want to call it a blockbuster trade, and we'll get into this more. But there was a trade for Cleveland. They got rid of Deion Waiters, which we've been discussing. So we'll be talking that. So those are our three topics, and we'll be getting into those more on the show. Uh, first off, last week for our poll, we actually did a rerun. So to start the season... I was really excited about the Daryl Morey-Mark Cuban feud is what I called it. Basically, they had started taking shots at each other to start the season. Daryl Morey basically made the implication that Mark Cuban, the only reason the Spurs, not the Spurs, well, the Mavericks were good was because of Dirk Nowitzki. Uh, Mark Cuban went and signed Chandler Parson at a nightclub. Uh, Daryl Morey tried to sign Dirk Nowitzki. It was great. Well, obviously, after the Josh Smith in Rajon Rondo moves, uh, we thought that you know the feud had, had heated up even more. So we asked you what you thought, and it's funny because when we first tuned in, they were tied. They were like dead even. In the time between that show and you know when we, we looked back in, Daryl Morey had taken a slight lead. But after last week's show, Mark Cuban is up 126 to 99 now, uh, thanks to the Rajon Rondo versus Josh Smith trade. So, geez, we're just not fans of Josh Smith. And I feel robbed. I put in my vote before that trade, so that's okay. I'll stick with you, Bori, despite you always... that bad move on Black. What I will say is uh, only one of those two follows me on Twitter, so you know that, that already gets the vote. 
All right. So with that said, let's let's jump into a more somber topic. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going to have Patrick on the show more regularly. Hopefully, his schedule next year allows for him to both co-host and, in some cases, because I would love to take uh, some nights off, actually host the show. But he wrote a really interesting post, and he had been batting this around, and he called he called it "Let's face it, we're all racists." And this is a really Really, really interesting t- topic. And by the way, I'm I'm completely on board. I realize I keep saying interesting, and that sometimes I know some ways you can divorce yourself. You can use clever fluff words to make it sound like you're behind something when really you're not. No, I'm completely behind this. Post. Interesting, you put it that way, Dre. Ah, clever. Um. Anyway, so he had actually been batting this around with me for a while and said he was really nervous about putting it out because he didn't know the right way to phrase it. I've been in the same boat where I've had ideas for things that I want. I don't have time to write a post for, but I think they're too deep to put on Twitter so they don't go anywhere because I feel if I put them on Twitter, um, they're going to get taken the wrong way and I don't have time to make a post. What Patrick talks about in this piece is basically implicit racism versus explicit. And what, what I can say to that is the difference you can kind of look at between implicit versus explicit racism is you can look at Donald Sterling for explicit racism. This is a person that clearly doesn't like minorities, that clearly voices opinions about it and clearly acts on it, you know, asks to not have minorities at the game or whatever, or treats, you know, his tenants who are minorities poorly versus what I would call implicit racism. What you might look at more, this more for is the hawks. Now, it's not quite implicit enough there. The Hawks, I deal, do still think smacked of racism. But when the Hawks emails leaked, basically they had this problem where they were saying, we have these issues, but, you know, we, you know, their, their, their thoughts were more, why is business bad? Why aren't, we getting the, why aren't we getting the people we want in the building? So those are both still explicit. But what I'll say for implicit is where you have underlying systems in place that basically favor one group, in this case, a race over another. And it's really hard to get into that. And by what I mean by really hard to get into it is it's really, really easy, I guess, relatively right, um, to solve explicit racism. You identify people that are racists. You say, it's not okay for you to act that way. Everybody's happy, right? And in fact, uh, the very first commenter on this, um, you know, Love you, commenters. And I didn't have a problem with this. In fact, you guys on this post have been very, very good. I've only had to delete, I think, three comments. Uh, one of them was just bizarre because they basically said, "You're now that Dave Barry has given you an audience, and I think that's kind of diminutive because we've done a lot of really good work in the last several years on our own. But now that Dave Barry has given you an audience, you're just going to voice your views. And this post was citing an article by Dave Barry. So it's not as if Dave Barry is against this post. Uh, But that said, the very first person said, I'm not from the U.S., so I don't really understand this racism you have. I don't, you know, I don't see different people. I think everybody's okay. And this is actually kind of the problem we're talking about, where it gets really hard to combat implicit racism where people say, I'm not racist. I don't think black people are worse than white people or whatever. What's come up here, and actually a podcast I did with E.J. Fisher at Nerd Numbers when I still thought I was going to be hopping back there, We talked about the Harvard Implicit Association Tests. And what these are is they pop up a word like good or bad. They're, you know, more complicated than that. And every time they pop up a word, they want you to basically associate it with an image above the person. And the person is black or white. And what gets difficult is you can have, say, Martin Luther King um, versus Hitler and have good and bad. And, you know, it's actually harder for us. We have to think a little longer to associate the correct words with Martin Luther King than we do with, say, Hitler, because you swap the colors, or if you swap black versus white at the top and then try and do the association. Every time you see the word bad, put it next to black. Every time you see the word good, put it next to white. If you ask the people to flip those, it's really hard for them. Basically, it takes mental effort. So even if you are explicitly not racist, even if you explicitly say, I don't see color, I'm not a racist, I just judge people based on their merits, which makes me chuckle. Another one of uh, a, a common background conversation Brian and I have is the tech industry and these popular words. A really popular one is meritocracy. Uh, and it just drives me batty because people use meritocracy as this belief that people are implicitly better and we reward people who are the best and try and kind of ignore the idea that we may have underlying systems that favor, you know, white 20 year olds as opposed to, you know, for instance, uh, contrapositive, a black older person. And um, one of the examples I actually give there is I worked at Google and they were really proud of their interview process. I mean, I actually, I don't know if they've updated the process since I've left the company, but I was actually interview trained at Google, which meant I was qualified to interview people to work at Google. 
one of the categories they had was to say, is this person googly, which, you know, was kind of a, are they a good, what they called culture fit? And the issue with that kind of question, ironically, is that if I'm interviewing someone, what I'm probably going to look for, this is the implicit bias I was discussing, I'm going to look for people that are similar to me. Now, I might not realize this. I might not realize that the status quo is very comfortable to me, and outside of the status quo is uncomfortable. But what that means is I might have this little bias in the back of my head that says white 20-year-old is good because that's what everybody is at Google, and outside of that is bad. And then when I'm asked to mark the person as a good culture fit, I might that might influence my decision there. So we might have people who are perfectly good fits that I was just uncomfortable with that don't get the nod. That's what kind of implicit racism is. All right, so apologies. Uh, this may be a little disjoint for those of you listening to the podcast. I was just dropped by Skype, the wonderful world of Skype. We might have to just start doing like Google Plus or something, Brian. Uh, but anyway, I was talking about implicit racism and kind of what I was taught. I think I brought up the Harvard Implicit Association Test. And these are these tests that ask you to associate a word with a phrase like black or white or an image of a black or white person with a word good or bad. And basically, they're able to test at the how much longer it takes you to, you know, when you think of the word good, think black or white. And what we, they find is lots of people have these inherent biases that, you know, unsurprisingly, you know, you, would, you could classify as racist. And that's what this problem we get into is, is that it's really easy to solve explicit racism. It's really hard to solve implicit racism. And one of the kind of the things about implicit racism is that we're really fond of the status quo. It's just human beings in general. There were some great people in the comments section that were actually bringing this up about the idea of being able to be black versus racist and white versus racist. One of my favorite uh, YouTube videos, I'll include this in the links, is on um, what's called reverse racism. And they make the point that the reason when people bring up racist towards white people, and by the way, in the comments, I'm just giving you a flag warning right here. I don't want to hear it. For those of you that come up with reverse racism stuff, um, you know, it, it's, it's all well and good for you to think that, but just be aware it's a flag in the comments. I don't see it as uh, devil's advocate. I, ironically, Brian, I, when I was talking racism on Twitter today, I actually brought up a point that we got into a few weeks ago where I said, you know, white guys who use the term devil's advocate when they're really arguing for the mainstream uh, is one of my pet peeves. So apologies. I called you on that a few shows ago. Um, but yeah, when you try and argue devil's advocate and say reverse racism, there's this great clip that basically says the difference is that if you look at racism towards minorities, particularly black people in the United States, it is pervasive. It is a system that is in place that is meant to keep them down. And there are lots of reasons. There's lots of history for this. But, you know, you, can, you need to just look at things like um, pullover rates, incarceration rates, um, length of prison terms for the same crime. Uh, there's a great link, uh, I, the, the Vlog Brothers, they have a great one on this that I'll include in links too. But, so that's the difference, right? Is when people are like, well, some black people don't like white people. You go, yeah, but there is not this gigantic system in place that you know hampers the progress of white people in the United States right now, where there are these system in place for black people, Hispanic people, women, minorities, et cetera. You know, they are there. And so that, but the reason for that is the implicit, the implicit racism. You have these systems in place where people basically do things that reinforce these behaviors and they don't realize it. And like I said, the Harvard Implicit Association test is a good one. One of my favorite books is called Drunk Tank Pink. And what he talks about, one of the, the studies he does is he says, you give someone a piece of paper to read that has uncomfortable information on it, like, you know, like Joseph Stalin is good or whatever. Now, all you do to that piece of paper is you change the font, you make it harder to read, and you, you gauge the response. You ask people how upset they are by that piece of paper. Of course, they're going to be upset. They are going to be more upset when it is harder to read. And the reason is, when we are made uncomfortable, when something's hard to read, hard to see, et cetera, we get upset. And we are really bad, by the way, it turns out, at connecting our emotion to a logical train of thought. So if I'm upset, I will try and say, well, the reason I'm upset is X, and I may not know the reason why. And so when we talk implicit racism, this becomes important because it's possible if I'm interviewing someone and that person is a person of color, uh, that person is a female, you know, these things aren't very common in the tech field, I might feel uncomfortable because I'm not used to this person being around. I'm, that's going to make me uncomfortable. I'm going to start saying, well, I'm feeling uncomfortable, which means this person isn't doing well on the interview. I give them a worse score, and then it's less likely for them to get the job. 
And as you can see, what I'm hoping here, I'm not trying to like come out of here with pitchforks against people. What we're actually trying to do, and this was one of the punchlines of the post that Patrick brought up and then the David Berry post that he linked in time as well, which is to say, when we bury our heads in the sand about these problems and say, I'm not racist, I'm not sexist, I just judge people based on merit, instead of going, it's possible there's a system in place that prevents people of color, you know, females, et cetera, from getting the same opportunities. If instead of burying our heads, we, we bring that to the forefront and know ahead of time, hey, we may have this bias, that's how you combat it. And that was the feel-good story at the end of this. It was the NBA, when the big news story popped up that said refs are biased against people of color or whatever, then after that happened, they noticed a decline. Basically, that bias seemed to disappear after that story popped. Now, of course, the NBA wants to say there was never a problem, but of course, we can just look at the data and just go, that's clearly not true. But that's the point. If you can get tech companies, sports teams, et cetera, to say, we actually do have a bias and it doesn't make us bad people. It just means that we're humans that are used to the status quo. Things we're not used to make us uncomfortable and that might actually make it harder for us to make things more diverse. And until we recognize that we can't solve it, that was kind of the punchline and that's what Patrick said. And by the way, just another great person, someone I'm a huge fan of is Justin Halpern, because I actually made a comment after this that said, Hollywood is just really uncomfortable with minorities and lead roles. And I brought this up in response to on Twitter, a bunch of people are talking about how there's going to be a ghost in the shell live action movie, which is a really popular anime, and it's going to be starring Scarlett Johansson. And they basically talk about whitewashing. And this, by the way, just does make me infuriated how Hollywood will not let people of color be in roles that are arguably for them. For instance, uh, I, I, I love it to death. I love the Hunger Games movies. I'm actually a big fan of them. Katniss Everdeen is uh, awesome. I can't believe I'm dropping her name, but the lead actress who's also been great in X-Men is in it. A uh, huge fan of hers. But in the book, Katniss Everdeen is basically described, you can almost argue it it Italian because I almost said Italian. Wow, we're talking about racism and the same thing. But she was, she was basically, she was described as having olive skin and gray eyes in the books. And when they did the casting call for her, they explicitly asked for white people. And then if you look, and one of my favorite shows is Avatar. And basically some of the lead characters are obviously Inuit. They're supposed to be from uh, Alaska. Uh, in the when they made the movie, all of the lead characters are white. So Hollywood does have this problem with whitewashing, and I brought it up. And Justin Halpern responded, and I, I included the link, um, Brian, if you want to start scrolling that. But what I basically said there, he said, it's not as simple as you think. It, and we got into basically the implicit problem. What he said is, one of the biggest problems about having representation in Hollywood is all of the writers are white males. And the solution to that, right, is you need to kind of fix the writer's room. Well, how do you fix the writer's room if the, right, if the people hiring the writers are just comfortable with white men? So you have this really long chain of problem, and it's like it may not actually – in some cases, it may be the case that Hollywood is being explicitly racist. They may be saying we don't want minorities applying for this role. They may have, I believe, in the Sony hacks, they were saying Morgan – not Morgan Freeman, uh, Denzel Washington couldn't lead a movie that was going to do well overseas. You may have that, but you may have the other thing, which is – you have all of your writers are white males. What do they know how to write? All they know how to write for is white males, and now you don't get anything uh, against that. One show that I loved, by the way, that had a really diverse writer's room was 30 Rock. If you notice that show, that show had tons of representation, tons of different viewpoints. And one of the reasons was, if you read uh, Tina Fey's amazing biography, is she actually had a really diverse writing room with lots of different people in it. So you know, when we're talking about how to solve implicit racism, sometimes that's the case. And to the people, by the way, this sounds like affirmative action, by the way it is, to the people who say we're just trying to hire the best person for the job, I scoff at that so much, basically because of our entire sports thing that we're on, which is in sports where we have all the data, where we know what wins games, people are really, really bad at judging what makes a good player. So this belief that, you know, we have in the tech field and hiring people that we have this perfect system for knowing who the best person is going to be for a job just drives me batty. It's okay to hire more diverse people. Um, yeah, that was a, that's a long one, Brian. I know I always give you the last word before we move on. So uh, anything to go for there? I know that's a heavy subject. And yeah, be forewarned in the comments, you were really, really good on Patrick's piece. But this is one where I have the least amount of patience for people trying to be cute and actually being offensive. Yeah, I guess I'll go to the economic side here just briefly. And I, Arturo replied to your and Justin's tweets. And I think Paul Shirley and Dave Barry as well were tweeting about this kind of along similar lines, which is just, well, 
look at the economics. Arturo's point was studios are risk adverse right now. It's a tough time for movies, and um, they're not going to take chances on unknowns. So they got to stick with the big names, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we've talked about this before in other common tech term. No one got fired for buying Cisco. Exactly. It's, it's not that they're risk averse in the sense of success, because, you know, one of the things that is infuriating is if you look at movies that pass the Bechdel test, which is, do you have two female characters that just talk to each other for even a <laughs> second about something? Yeah. Other than a if you look for movies that did this, it, and I believe in 2014, these outperformed not, movies that didn't pass the Bechdel test. Um, I recall Arturo brought up Fast and the Furious 6. This is one of the most popular movie franchises. You know, that movie's got minority characters and a lot of Latin influence in it, right? Latin characters. So, and that movie did gangbusters. It's not that these movies aren't doing well. It's that a studio, when your job is, is based on people trusting the decisions you make, not how well those decisions turn out to be, you're not ever going to try and do something risky. Um, the Cracked podcast, which I brought up before, right? Everybody was super shocked by Frozen's success, and you're kind of going, wait a minute, you hmm. had the Disney princesses for years. You're telling me you actually just had a movie with two strong princesses and it did well? Really? Like, you're really shocked by that? Yeah, I was so going to really say that's surprising to hear. Yeah. I can't tell if you're being serious or not. No, I am. I, I can't believe people would doubt that movie before it when it came out. Well, I mean, if you saw, right, when it was being advertised, they had the talking snowman, the, the cute reindeer. Like, no one, clearly no one in Disney thought that a movie with two strong female mm. protagonists and no real love interest. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm spoiling Frozen. <laughs> Frozen at this point, though, like, what's your problem? Like, go watch Frozen. Uh, and I will spoil it for you. You haven't seen it. Like, you're clearly a villain. Shh, um, don't tell But, you know, Shh. Frozen, right, this movie that basically has no real strong romantic storyline is about two female characters. They were surprised it did well. And it's because, like, it was exactly what Justin Halpern's talking. When you're just talking to people that are, you know, white, male, middle-aged, they're not going to have the perspective outside. I mean, we even see this in the Wages of Wins group, right? We're a pretty diverse group, and that's nice because you get different perspectives. It's really, really easy to get tunnel vision quickly. Like, we talked that a few weeks ago, by the way, where I was saying, you know, looking at ESPN, we were kind of having this discussion and me going, realizing that the content there isn't for me. And mm. that's, you know, that's having a more empathic view than an egocentric view. And it's really hard, though, for the people in control not to have egocentric views, and that's basically the crux of implicit racism it's really hard not to only be able to see what it's like to be you it's really hard for you to know what it's like to be somebody else well yeah just think about the priorities of these producers making the decisions right sure diversity is probably somewhere on their priority list but it's way down there compared to other things so it's not going to get addressed and you actually have to put it there and by the way one yeah. thing i saw a good talk on this that is one other thing about ESPN. We can give them a pat on the back. Like that's funny. Yeah. It's so funny to me that all of the stuff I actually ding ESPN for is stuff I can just do myself. This is advanced stats, and all of the stuff that they do well is like at the higher level. Like right, ESPN thirty for thirty, getting that information out to millions of people is amazing. But ESPN has actually done a really good job at having really good diverse crews, and you can just see that on on shows. You know, I believe that was one of the initial, I think, digs. And, you know, rest in peace. He was an amazing anchor. But, thank uh, you. Stuart Scott, you said thank you? Yeah, thank you for mentioning him. Okay, I thought you were, like, saying, I'm like, not you, Brian. Not you, but, yeah. <laughs> Stuart, no. Stuart Scott, right? Um, no. I, I couldn't believe it either. Like, when I saw that came out, I was like, wow, that was, like, the face of ESPN for me, to be candid. The good face. Like, if, I'm not thinking Stephen A. Smith and Skip Davis. Um, but, you know, I can't believe that. You know, he'll be missed, but, you know, I, some people are talking about how people are saying his, his language and whatever was confusing at first when he came on the scene. But, no, ESPN was perfectly fine with that, and obviously not a mistake. He was amazing, and hats off to ESPN for doing that. But that's the point. You have to make it a priority, and this I'll, I'll link another TED Talk on this, but that's what they said is ESPN, when people came up with the affirmative action, uh, the line the guy had, I think it was, I forget his name, I apologize, but people said, do you want us to hire the best person for the job or a person of color for the job? And he said, yes. Nice. And so he put it as a priority, and clearly they've done well there. Now just put that same level of dedication into people who actually have passed math classes and we can get somewhere. Uh, so our next topic, by the way, is Jimmy Butler versus Derrick Rose, which I'll probably, I'm hoping to have one more piece out this week on. So that's what started. Um, I wrote a post, I was really proud of it, um, about MVPs and shooting. And the reason I brought this post up actually 
was because Derrick Rose's MVP is one of the worst in, in recent history. Um, he's one of the worst recipients of the MVP award, and he was one of the most inefficient shooters. But what shocked me, by the way, is he was only the fourth worst shooter in NBA history in terms of winning the MVP award. Uh, the metric I use is true shooting percentage. That takes into account three-point shooting and free throws. Uh, when I say worst in history, I did only include 1980 onward because obviously guards um, pre three point shot line are going to have a disadvantage compared to modern day guards. But he shot about 55 percent true shooting the year he won, which obviously it was better than Allen Iverson in 2001. I will never forgive you voters. I will never forgive you for 2001. You have no excuse. Um, all of you should have lost your right to vote on the MVP after that, that award. Anybody that voted in the 2001 award that still has a vote. I'm ashamed of you as a person. Um, but it turned out that Derrick Rose actually came in in front of Michael Jordan in, in 1998, and basically it was the same trick. Derrick Rose has been on some very strong teams. Now, he's been a good player on those strong teams, and Michael Jordan in 1998 was also a good player. But that's the problem, is the voters don't really know how to distinguish all of these other things that win games. They don't know how to, you know, we use this word role player what we should stress is the mainstream media doesn't really even know how to define what a role player is, much less evaluate what being a good role player is. So Derrick Rose basically won for being on a team, I think, with Roswell Butler, Joaquin Noah. I'm trying to think. There were a bunch of Kyle Korver was on that team. And oh, my goodness, look at Kyle Korver this season. I tweeted this out today, but he's shooting 71.5% true shooting. He's shooting 8.1 shots a game, I think, around there. And the only other person that's taken as many shots and shot as well across an entire season in NBA history is Artis Gilmore in the early 80s. So, you know, Kyle Korver, really unique company. He was on the Bulls team that, you know, won 60 games with Derrick Rose when Derrick Rose won the MVP. And what also made this more interesting to me, though, what got me down this line of thought is I was looking at Jimmy Butler. And Jimmy Butler this season is a legitimate MVP candidate. Uh, currently, I believe he's fourth in the NBA behind Anthony Unibrow Davis, Chris Paul, DeAndre Jordan, who has had an absurd stretch those last four games. He's not going to stay in front of Chris Paul for the season, but oh my goodness, DeAndre Jordan, you've been playing out of your mind. And then, of course, number four is Jimmy Butler. And I actually made the comment earlier this week, and this is what got me started on the research, which was to say, as of now, Jimmy Butler's actually had a better career than Derrick Rose. Uh, if we look at their career wins produced, Jimmy Butler has produced 30.3 over his career. And Derrick Rose has only produced 24 at this point. Now, obviously, the thing Derrick Rose has done better in his career is he scored more points. But almost everything else Jimmy Butler has just been better at. Uh, rebounds, you know, he doesn't assist as much, obviously, as a shooting guard, but he keeps his turnovers low. He's really good on defense. Um, and that's another thing. Everybody that comes up and says, you guys don't factor in defense well enough to, to wins produced, you know, a discussion that I have no problem with, as I've mentioned many times, for the record, if you say that to us, that if you dislike wins produced for that reason, then you have to hate win shares and hate BPM. Just be aware of that. Um, but that said, you know, Jimmy Butler, everybody says, is an amazing defender as well. So he's actually, by those people's logic, better than he appears by the numbers. And by the numbers, he has been much better than Derrick Rose. And actually, that's my point here is when Derrick Rose won MVP, he won by being on a very deep, very good team. Jimmy Butler, he's also on a good team again. You know, Pau Gasol is having an amazing resurgence. Noah's having an off year, but is still a good player. So the Bulls are still a good team. But Jimmy Butler is basically having an MVP season. And that's why the Bulls are turning it around this year, in part. And, you know, what? one of the other things that we can kind of, a tangent on this that we can look at is with Pau Gasol's resurgence, we can only look at the Chris Paul trade that went through, or didn't go through, rather, and say, wow, what could have been, right? If, if Pau Gasol goes to Houston, Chris Paul goes to Los Angeles, um, you, could basically, you could basically be having um, a completely changed timeline where the Lakers are, you know, the Lakers are playing really well right now, as opposed to Houston, who, you know, has ended up with everything. So with that in mind, though, yeah, that's just that was all I wanted to say is I think Jimmy Butler is an MVP candidate this season. Hasn't gotten enough love his entire career. And another thing about Jimmy Butler, for those of you that bring up the usage curve, he is shooting more this year and shooting more efficiently. So the, like, the reason I love Jimmy Butler is he is a combination of everything. He is a really, really good player that hasn't been getting his due. He is playing like an MVP. If you just give him more responsibility, he's playing better with it. And yeah, at this point, Jimmy Butler has been a better player for the Bulls than Derrick Rose. And uh, I just definitely want to give him some love for that. I don't think he's got in his career, and I hope he starts getting more respect for it. Uh, and yeah, like I said, um, I don't 
I can't really fault Derek Rose for his MVP. Um, it's not his fault. It's the voters' fault. But I am just saying, you know, Derek Rose was not the MVP, nor was Michael Jordan in 1998. This is a case of voters being too in love with narrative and not enough with stats, in my opinion. Uh, and it's unfortunate the Bulls, in my opinion, have had two of the most undeserving MVPs in MVP history. At least, though, they're not Allen Iverson. Anything to say on that, Brian? No, just that I definitely made a flipping comment about Butler getting national media attention now that he's taking more shots this year, and really most of his numbers are similar to what they were in past years. But overall, I'm glad he's getting the attention. He deserves it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's absurd to think that if Butler had kept everything else the same but was suddenly getting four more rebounds a game, he would not be getting this level. Absolutely. That's a much better way to look at it. But, I mean, that said, I'm glad he's getting it. I hope he gets the payday he deserves. I hope he gets the accolades he deserves. We've loved Jimmy Butler. Um, when I was playing, I, I dropped the Fantasy League this year, but last year when I was playing in the Fantasy League, Ari Caroline, I believe, still has Jimmy Butler. So hopefully you're doing well this year, Ari. But, like, he was untouchable. I was like, I'll, I want to trade. I'll trade. Is Jimmy Butler on the table? And he was like, absolutely not. So we've recognized his talent and ability. I'm glad other people are starting. Yeah, selfishly speaking, I was hoping for, you know, a Clay Thompson and David Lee trade for him maybe. But, yeah, that's not going to happen now. I uh, could. Never know. You never know. Um, well, actually, on that note, I know it wasn't as long. But, you know, with, we'll, we'll see more. I'll, I'll try and write some more about Butler and Rose. On the topics of just interesting trades, we had Dion Waiters. Now, when I talked fantasy, by the way, this hurt. If you play daily fantasy, this actually hurt you last night. The Dion Waiters trade went through after games had started. So that meant J.R. Smith and Dion Waiters were both off the table. And that just has to hurt. But this trade was surprising, and I don't know my thoughts on it, to be honest. Um, so here's a breakdown of the trade. The Thunder... And by the way, here's what I posted. Oh, and I forgot to give you this link, Brian, uh, but the, the post is called The Thunder's Model for Success, and it was at Wages of Wins. But the Thunder traded for Deion Waiters, and right after this, I made a tweet where I said, you know, if, well, not right before, when, when the trade was up in the air, when Wojnarowski had broken it, I said, if the Thunder get Deion Waiters, we can pretty much do away with the narrative of having a smart front office and just change it to lucked into Durant, Harden, Westbrook, and Ibaka. And the trade went through, and I, I stand by that. Two years ago, I wrote about how really the reason the Thunder were successful was Kevin Durant, who was a player they weren't supposed to get with a pick they weren't supposed to have. So what good is that information, right? You can't, you can't applaud a front office for being really smart when the, the biggest driver behind their success was essentially luck. And they just they, they traded away for Deion Waiters. The, one, the only good thing about this is, Earlier reports had Reggie Jackson in the mix. And so if they traded away Reggie Jackson and got Deion Waiters, I would just say game over. Now, at that said, this was still a horrible trade. The Cavaliers ended up with Iman Shumpert and J.R. Smith. Now, so the problem with this trade was J.R. Smith. If they had just traded away Deion Waiters, I would actually have a lot of faith in them and say, hey, you're improving your team. And Iman Shumpert hasn't been good, but he's not terrible. He's better than um, Deion Waiters. But J.R. Smith has just been terrible. And I had an interesting discussion with someone about this. And I'm actually going to give a little credit to George Carl. I know that's a shocker. Um, J.R. Smith is a head case. And while we normally don't like talking about non-box score, non-trackable statistics in terms of team construction, it is worth noting that having locker room cohesion is important. And if you're going to have someone that is kind of a locker room virus, they better be good. I will, I'll put up with Dennis Rodman. I'll put up with Michael Jordan. I'll put up with, in his prime, Kobe Bryant. But I, I'm not putting up with the below average, close to 30 J.R. Smith in my locker room if it, if it means potentially harming a championship-worthy team. And just for the record, if you have a healthy, with how he's playing now, Russell Westbrook and a healthy Kevin Durant, you have a championship-worthy team. You just have to not have terrible players like Deion Waiters. And so it's the same thing here, though, with the Cavaliers. Oh, sorry, and I flipped that. That's what I meant. The Cavaliers have a championship-worthy team because they have Love and Braun. And anytime you have stars of those caliber, you have a championship-worthy team, and the same is true of Oklahoma City. So my real complaint with this trade is both of these teams have title-worthy teams, arguably. They have to have a decent you know, bench because the West is really rough, and to be able to compete with the top teams like, you know, they're not playing it right now, but, you know, the Spurs, the Clippers, the, the Warriors – how weird is it, Brian, to call the Warriors the number one team right now? I'm still not used like, to it yet. I can't. If you would ask me, I still would deny it. I haven't I, accepted I it yet. 
It's it's a it's a it's a well constructed. I mean, they got some luck there with uh, Bogut and Curry being healthy, but that team is well constructed. It's a good team. It's and the, the the players that we were bagging on, which is Harrison Barnes and Clay Thompson. I still think uh, Clay Thompson's overpaid, but you know how they structured a salary. It's not the cap hit it would be if if they had structured it differently. So everything is roll everything is going right for that team right now and that's that's really bizarre so good job to the uh good job to the warriors yeah i don't want to get too off topic here but man draymond green that guy is doing a lot of work for them that's well, a he big key before, right he he's like, even better this year yeah that's that's a, i mean i, I don't know like, he's getting he got a triple double recently he's getting like he's putting he's looking like i don't know kenneth farid or something out there but he shoots threes looking crazy with the steals, and blocks, and rebounds. That's, that's a team like the Warriors right now. You know, your only hope to hang with the Warriors is either an injury in playoff time, which, you know, has happened a few times to them, as we've mentioned, like they haven't had Bogut, or getting a good bench, and that's the problem. Neither the Thunder or the Cavs really did much to bolster their bunch here. If the Cavs were to just waive J.R. Smith, I would buy this trade. I would say they needed to get rid of waiters. They got a serviceable young player. You know, Iman Shumpert's not good, but he's not terrible. Um, but J.R. Smith on that team just has me worried. And Deion Waiters on the Thunder, basically, like I'm saying, the fact that that's all the Thunder got out of this trade, uh, game over. Um, the Knicks, I'm okay with it. You know, they got, they got, they probably have a draft pick. Um, it's a lottery protected pick from the Thunder, so they'll probably get a first round pick this year or next. They got some young players. I can't speak too much to them. I haven't done too much analysis. So when you're in a trade with the Knicks and you don't win that trade, that was not a good trade. That's kind of my personal take. And Typically, whenever there's a trade where none of the players involved are above average, I'm just not excited about it. So my candid take is, if you're looking at this, who won this trade? New York won this trade. Um, but whoop de doo they're a horrible team right now. They're still not going to make the playoffs. They're still going to be in the lottery, and I don't think they own their draft pick this year. I'll have to look that up. Um, the Thunder completely lost this trade, and the Cavaliers, who knows? That's, that's my readings on this trade thus far. Uh, one other note on trades, uh, we had a commenter who, who emailed me and was asking about the Rondo trade and was basically upset that we only talked about it on the perspective from the Mavs. So I'm really sorry to say this. I'll, I'll give another follow-up to that trade. I'm not excited about the Celtics right now. I'm sorry. They don't seem to know what they're doing. So it's depressing to have to say that. But yeah, when you wanted more Celtics analysis, there's your Celtics analysis. They're not, they're not in good shape. All right. So any thoughts you have on the way? To, I know you like... You uh, you tweeted me a, a funny story about uh, Kevin Durant, and then you made the point that uh, LeBron James is off playing GM. I think uh, Julian Rogers said that. So those are some funny things. Do you have any comments on those? Yeah, I'll save his shout out for the end of the show, but I will show the uh, SB Nation article with, uh, I'll put that on screen right now. Kevin Durant saying that the Thunder will make waiters feel wanted. So um, I guess he's going to take better care of waiters than LeBron did. But um, my comment was, well, this is, this is like Patrick's Jack 8 poker situation, which for those who didn't listen to the show last week when we did that is the argument is basically, well, maybe Durant is great. Maybe he can make his teammates around him better. However, why not just start off with a better player to maybe begin with? But no, the idea that... So the reason why I point this article out is that Durant is being Mark Cuban here in this situation. That's what I'm trying to say. What's he is, funny about this trade, too, is uh, Magic Johnson made a comment, similar one. He said, if J.R. Smith can get consistency in shot selection, he'll be a great help. And I went, J.R. Smith's been in the league 11 years. Like, if that's your logic, this guy could be a great player if he just does this. Don't start with an 11-year veteran that hasn't been showing progress. Drew, so, you know, with that, uh, I think I'm, you know, done with the show, unless you have anything else to say, Brian. No, we can head into shout outs right now. Um, you know, we got a good 45 minutes in, so I'm okay with that. Uh, good show. Do, do you have any shout outs to actually give this week? And I'm, I'm actually going to call it a cheat. I, I do appreciate it when you shout out us and our commenters, but I do think it a cheat. So do you have any legitimate shout outs this week? Sure. No, my shout out you already mentioned was Julian Roger. Uh, he's got a blog of his own. Uh, maybe, let's see. Let's bring up his channel here and promote it. Yeah, here we go. Here's his tweet. Yeah, LeBron went, fuck it. I need to concentrate on GMing for two weeks here. Guess the implication being I don't need to be on the court. I just need to fix this team's roster. So I'm a little higher on Shumpert than you, so I think the Cavs might have done well. And they got the draft pick as well. So I think LeBron did okay if he were the GM for this trade. All right. So first off, I don't normally give um, 
shout out. I, I like at least mentioning the commenters. So thanks last week for the comments on the show. I did appreciate it. Uh, the ice is fake. Andrew Sutton rebounds. Rebounds in three is great name. Uh, we always like DG22. Oh, by the way, a DG22 note. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the very first segment. Uh, I've mentioned before my comment policy section, which is I, I tend to lean more towards deletion as opposed to moderation or editing. Uh, I did actually delete a comment on the Patrick's racist one, and that was because it failed one of my litmus, which is just, if, is it true? And so I, I want to apologize for that, but I want to explain, you know, I don't have the time to go in and correct false comments or necessarily correct grammar or whatever. So I may delete a comment if it's just, even if it's nice or polite, and I had to do that. Uh, the comment was about um, in Ferguson getting a trial, which didn't happen. So I deleted that. So that, you know, I, I, I wanted to bring that up and say to the commenters, you know, I realize in some days it may be harsher because I don't have the time. I'd rather do this show. I'd rather write posts. I have, you know, a job as well. So sometimes the comment's going to get deleted. You guys haven't been too mean about it. So I appreciate that. You've been very nice in the comments, but I did want to, you know, come up and just explain a little more about that. Sometimes your comments are going to go missing, so to speak because they have untrue information and I don't have the time to edit them as much as I want. Uh, last week, there was some discussion about Andrew Wiggins in the comments section. And what I want to stress is our take wasn't that we were against Andrew Wiggins getting time to develop. It was actually the other way around. We don't think teams give young players enough time to develop. And all we're saying, though, is don't be so high on young players at the cost of established stars like Kevin Love. But we're also not saying that you should give up. Like, I don't think the team should give up on Wiggins after one season. You know, he's on a rookie deal. He's inexpensive. Uh, they're not making the playoffs. So, you know, give him some time. See if he develops. See if he turns into trade fodder. But when his extensions come due, that's when you actually have to give up on him if he's not progressed to the level you need. So if I'm advising the Timberwolves, ask yourself how good you want Andrew Wiggins to be at the end of two years, at the end of three years, at the end of four years. If he doesn't hit those marks, pass. If he hits them, resign him. All right. Now, uh, my shout out, let me just get the tweet in front of me. And I apologize, Brian, I did not actually um, hand this off to you. I think it was with KJ underscore NBA. And I believe that the tweet was he was talking about um, we were talking. Yeah, we were talking about I apologize. This is terrible. I really wish I had. Uh, I really wish I had time to, uh, to edit this out. But KJ NBA gets my shout out because he basically said the question about Andrew um, Anthony Davis. Wow, you can clearly see I'm flustered trying to read quickly while I'm doing this. But he said the thing about Anthony Davis is it's like one of Khaleesi's dragons. The question is just how scary is that thing going to get? Mic drop, best analogy of the year for uh, Anthony Davis happens in January. So metaphor of the year, that's my shout out there. And the other shout out, I already said this early in the show, is actually to George Carl. Uh, I think I've been hard on his player evaluation, but I actually think when you look at, we were talking things like J.R. Smith and, you know, Deion Waiters and having to deal with locker room cohesion, I think he actually did do a good job of keeping a very volatile Nuggets team from imploding, especially when I happen to know there were front office things in place that may have prevented him from moving players. So, you know, now that a few years have passed and I've mellowed a little, I can actually say, George Carl, maybe you weren't. Maybe you weren't as bad as I thought. So that's my other shout out. Very equitable. I appreciate it. All right. Well, that's all I got, Brian. So if you don't have anything else, we'll see you next week.